So, hello everyone. Hello everyone who is here and who is watching us online. Uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I know it's almost the last session of the almost last day. So, <laughs> it's really great to have you here uh, to hear us. Uh, so thank you for everyone and thank you for our panelists, Renata, who is on my right side, Anna, who is my, on my left side, and Eliana and Herman, who will be joining us online. So uh, just to give a quick overview on the topic and why did we propose a session with this topic? So. The topic in general, I mean, what do you want to discuss? We want to discuss uh, what it is the role of marketing and advertising dynamics uh, and actors on the information environment, which is the risks, uh, which are the implications, and how can we build, and this is the key issue, how can we build best practices and guidelines for the advertisement industry. And I think it's worth mentioning that this topic, it actually appeared in uh, for us through a project we developed last year who we called uh, in Portuguese, the Zinfo. And I think it's worth, I realize that I haven't presented myself. My name is Eloisa. I am director at Internet Lab. Internet Lab is a Brazilian think tank on digital rights and internet policy. And we developed last year this project called the Zinfo, uh, who mapped, uh, who aimed at developing best practices, actually start developing and start this conversation on best practices and guidelines for the advertisement industry, bearing in mind the role of the marketing industry on the information environment. And this is important because the marketing industry have, has always had an important role in shaping the information environment and influencing, influencing it. And it's interesting to think about it in two levels, when it's more economical or structural, uh, that the way the commercial marketing uh, structure itself and where it puts money and where it advertises its species, uh, it's normally a key source. The commercial marketing is normally a key source of funding for information for newspapers, and it has always been. But and on the second level, there is also the narrative side of it that marketing upholds and creates narratives that impacts the information environment. And it becomes more uh, prominent in the digital area where information, uh, the production of information is decentralized and new forms of digital marketing and new strategies of digital marketing appear. And the, there is also, we can say there's uh, crisis on the authority of science and journalism. So with all this together, this team becomes even more important when we move online. So uh, during this project, what we did, and I will stop here and pass to the our invitation, our invitees, is that we actually mapped the initial, the initial teams and the initial subjects that related with digital marketing, with actually marketing and advertisement in general, and the information environment. Based on that, we workshopped these teams with uh, Brazilian digital marketing actors. This was a collaborative project to develop it, develop it with a marketing agency. And we workshopped these teams. And the goal was to try to understand how this appeared on their daily work and how we could uh, move towards guidelines and best practices. And the result of this uh, was what we called a uh, working guide for actually in development guide for digital marketing. Uh, who covers topics such as influencer marketing and the importance of ethical safeguards in good practices 
when higher influence in influences from marketing. Uh, social media ads what we and website banners, what we call the programmatic ads, and the importance of developing an underst understanding of how they work and who will be uh, financed depending on the choices and the structures. And finally, uh, the last topic, the narratives that can be created and fostered by disinformation, by advertisement campaigns. And I would say that the key takeaway of these workshops that is on the guide, it's the importance of embedding uh, risk analysis in which regards disinformation and hate speech on the whole process of developing marketing campaigns and advertisement strategies. So I would say this was a really rich process that we were really able to engage with a lot of marketing actors in the country, but it was, as I said, like a first step. We wanted like to open the conversation. And the aim of this panel is like to dig in into this topic and like to create the opportunity to develop further on the challenges and the possible uh, ways to go uh, under this topic. So I have said enough and I will pass. What we will do is a first round of five minutes with our speakers and then we will open the floor and then we get back. So first, uh, I, would I want to invite Eliana Quiroz, who is joining us online. And she is the mem a member of the board of Internet Bolivia. She holds a PhD, uh, she's a PhD candidate at Universidad Mayor de San Andres, La Paz, focusing on disinformation's impact on marginalized communities. She holds a master in public administration and has 20 years of experience in international cooperation agencies, including the World Bank and the United Nations. In 2021, she researched disinformation during Bolivia's political crisis and authored the first academic handbook on internet and society in Bolivia. And Eliana will give us a brief overview on the role of digital marketing uh, and in this information disorder. Uh, Eliana, please, the floor is yours. Hi, <coughs> Hi Eloisa, thank you. Um, good morning here. <laughs> and I guess uh, uh, good afternoon and good evening there. Uh, and everywhere. So thank you for the invitation. And your introduction was was really great because, uh, especially because Brazil is one of the examples uh, of this information and campaigns in in the world. And you you come with the examples from from grassroots so from the practice. Um, I want to share uh, some initial thoughts from my research in. Uh, in Bolivia, and also trying to understand what, uh, what are which are the actors of a disinformation ecosystem. And um, when we are talking about that, uh, it's uh, very obvious that uh, private companies are uh, key actors on the on the disinformation ecosystem. And I'm talking about, of course, uh, marketing um, companies, uh, which is the focus of this session. But when I'm trying like to uh, identify these marketing companies in the practice, uh, the, the borders of uh, different private companies offering different services blurs. So you, we can find, for example, platforms, uh, digital platforms, giving advice on uh, marketing strategies. Um, for example, is is very uh, well known that when uh, um, Meta has uh, big clients, let's say clients that are going to spend one million, half million uh, dollars in their platforms in in Instagram and Facebook, um, they they bring some uh, intermediary between this client, this big client, let's say, and and Meta, and this. Uh, um this um intermediary uh, is there to help them to micro target uh, and 
uh, direct the, the ads in, in the best way. In, and in, in that moment, this uh, uh, intermediary is bringing some services around marketing, digital marketing strategies. And in Bolivia, for example, uh, that uh, this intermediary was a, a bureau of, um, of lawyers. But in Peru, for example, it's El Comercio. It's a, a well-known, a mainstream newspaper. Um, or, for example, when I'm talking about blurring like these this, this borders that are not so clear, marketing companies offering databases or even data science services. So my first point here is that when talking about marketing private companies as a, an actor of this information ecosystem, we are really talking about private entities, different private entities, bringing services, and of course, uh, having um, um, a, an interest of making money uh, out of this business. So we are trying. We, we should try to understand each ecosystem in the practice as they they work uh, in each country to identify not only marketing companies but different. Uh, private companies or private actors, private entities. The second uh, idea is that uh, these um, um, companies uh, have a model, and the model is Cambridge Analytic. So when you have a lot of money and a lot of interest, you will have the whole model of Cambridge Analytica. And when there is less money or less time, uh, we will have only some parts of this, this model. And I'm talking about this, thinking about the South. In the South, you will find, for example, some, some countries that uh, do have uh, a lot of money to spend. So it's perhaps the case of Brazil, Mexico, Philippines. And you will find almost the whole model. But sometimes there are less money, so you will find perhaps even not marketing companies, but influencers or content creators, or what we talk TikTokers, bringing these services of marketing, digital marketing uh, campaigns. Um, and even also journalists, journalists that uh, are, are having a, a, a very hard time because uh, media shortage, because the media, the model, the business model of media are in crisis. Uh, and many journalists are in the streets without employment, but they know about the information flows. So perhaps we will find some journalists um, creating some um, some um, a part of the services of marketing, uh, um, a marketing um, digital uh, strategies. So. In the South, I would say you will find a, a wide range of uh, marketing services, digital marketing services for campaigns, for disinformation campaigns. So all, again, when we are looking at uh, a country and a specific country, it's good to understand that you will find different actors, a lot of actors playing this uh, some part of the uh, uh, of the roles of the ecosystem disinformation uh, of disinformation. I would say that to begin, then we will dig a, a little bit more on, on perhaps the solutions or, or, or the way forward. Thank you, Eliana. Uh, I will pass now the word to Anna Kompanek, who is here uh, in person with us. Anna is Director for Global Programs at the Center for International Private Enterprise. She manages a portfolio of programs spanning emerging and frontier mar markets around the world in CP's core teams of business advocacy, strengthening entrepreneurship ecosystem and institutional trust, economic inclusion and organizational resilience. Komponak holds a BA in International Studies from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, a master's degree in German and European Studies from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and an MBA from George Mason University. She is a certified compliance and ethics professional international and a graduate of the U.S. Chamber of 
Commerce Institute for Organization Management. And Anna will dig into the role of the private sector and how can we work towards developing good practices and recommendations. Thank you so much, Eloise. And I feel like I um, should start with an explanation. You know, when we say private sector in fora like IGF, typically what comes to mind is big tech companies. Here we uh, talked about um, marketing companies. I want to expand that the definition a little bit further and focus on um, a different segment of the private sector, which perhaps I, I could call uh, just local business community for more clarity, uh, because that is the segment that uh, my organization, Center for International Private Enterprise, or CIP, or CIPE, if you speak Spanish, or I guess Portuguese works as well. Uh, that is um, the, 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 the market segment, if you will, uh, that we work with. And um, I have to say, in conversations about um, combating disinformation and, and building healthier information spaces, um, the role of the local private sector as a sort of stakeholder and, and potentially an ally um, is not often um, talked about, so I appreciate this opportunity. Um, because ultimately, so you mentioned the, the, the marketing uh, companies, ultimately there is also a question, um, what about the companies that pay to have their advertisements placed uh, in different online spaces through the marketing um, agencies? Uh, so what, what we're seeing in countries around the world is in, in many cases um, uh, there may be just an issue of basic uh, lack of knowledge. You know, companies don't necessarily think about um, how their marketing spend may be contributing to disinformation because their you know, basic metric when they buy uh, ads is eyeballs, right? How many how many eyeballs are seeing this ad? I, does it help us generate more sales and so on? Uh, but they don't always consider other um, risk factors such as, uh, you know, uh, the some of the um, advertisements, for instance, may uh, appear on websites that are uh, well known to be associated with disinformation or, or disreputable in some other ways. Um, so there's just a basic question of, of sort of sensitizing um, uh, companies who pay for advertising to think beyond, you know, what are some other ramifications of where um, that money goes and, and where their ads appear. Um, and of course, I want to make it clear, so, you know, business, local business community in any country is not a monolith, so um, the companies themselves also uh, may be contributing to disinformation. In many cases, it's commercially motivated disinformation when uh, perhaps we publish uh, or, or, or um, pay for, for coverage that is not um, factually accurate, let's just say, of their competitor. Uh, so in, in, in some ways, there might be contributors to the disinformation problem. And of course, if, if our advertising spend uh, supports in directly or indirectly disinformation, that's a problem. Uh, but we are also victims of, of disinformation, be it through uh, just direct impact on their brand. Um, and also more broadly, uh, through the declining quality of the overall information space. So if the overall quality of journalism in a country suffers, uh, ultimately, those companies may not be able to get uh, you know, economic information, policy information um, that's trustworthy and that uh, is crucial uh, to their operations. So when we um, um, think about who sort of the key ally would be, that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that every company in a given country is interested in, in uh, doing something about uh, combating disinformation. They may not be, they may be actively <laughs> involved uh, in spreading it. In many cases, you have state-owned companies with may or otherwise politically controlled companies that, that may also be not so great actors. But uh, I would say there's a growing you know, segment of, of companies and, and, and they are a worthy ally. Um, who uh, recognize the dangers and who uh, also frankly see the business case to you know, improve their own conduct or their own information uh, footprint, if you will, um, and also to support uh, healthier information spaces um, and not just through uh, 
marketing spend or many other ways in which companies uh, can be constructive um, actors in uh, supporting independent journalism. If we have time and the conversation goes that way, I'll be happy to highlight other examples. Uh, for now, let me just mention that one of the uh, resources that may be of interest to the audience here is uh, a report that my um, organization and the Center for International Media Assistance, or CIMA, uh, worked on together jointly. It's called Investing in Facts, uh, how the business community can support uh, healthy uh, info spaces, where we did sort of a global scan of different ways in which private companies can be um, involved in uh, supporting uh, yeah, ethical, um, uh, independent journalism and, and, and uh, strong um, independent media spaces. Uh, ethical advertising is one of those ways, but there are others, uh, and I'll be happy to uh, get into that if we have time. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. This is really a great point, and was actually one of our takeaways also from the project that uh, actually engaging in countering or in ethical information ecosystem is also int is also something that it's important for the companies and the brands itself because it helps also with their public relations. So thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will go to Herman Wasserman. Uh, Herman is professor of the Department of Journalism at Stellenbosch University. He's joining us online today. He currently holds a professorship in media studies at the University of Cape Town and previously directed the Center for Film and Media Studies. An accompli accomplished alumnus of Stellenbosch University, Wasserman Academic Journal spans esteemed institutions both in South Africa and the United Kingdom. His extensive research in media, democracy, and society has earned him international recognition leading to memberships and leadership holes in permanent academic association. Herman, thank you for join joining us today. And Herman uh, will actually uh, cover for us a little bit today the disparities on the comprehension of this information between the, no the Global North and the Global South and how this can also impact the discussion we are having here today. So please, Herman, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. It is a great privilege to be joining you, unfortunately, not in person, but uh, remotely. Um, I have received two questions, Heloise, is that correct? Uh, the, the one on the disparities and the second also then on uh, the role of advertisement. Um, so I'll say something very brief on them, um, both to allow for more time for discussion and questions, um, you know, as this is obviously not the, the optimal uh, way of, of making a, a, a broad contribution, but it's maybe just some some points to consider. So I think in terms of the first question, considering the disparities between global north and south and how this information dynamics manifest in these regions, I think there are two points or two main points to consider in this regard. I think firstly, um, it is that this information has existed in the global south for a long time. Um, we have seen recently that it has become a, a preoccupation in scholarship and policy debates in the global north. Um, we can track that, and we have tracked it in our research um, that scholarly production around this information peaked in 2016. Um, no surprise why that is the case around the elections in the US at that point. And from then on, it sort of grew um, uh, you know, very steeply in terms of scholarly research. But when we actually consider the, the presence of what we now call this information, um, it is on a continuum with, with the, uh, st communication strategies, types of communication, um, propaganda even, that have been in, uh, present in the Global South for a long time. And not only disinformation, but also the other related issues, such as um, the pressure on the information environment, the pressure on free um, and, and accurate exchange, um, the pressure on the public sphere, all of these things that we now associate with what has been come to call the, the information disorder. Um, these discourses have been in the, and, and these trends have been in the global south for a long time. One could even say, I think, that the, the discourses that kept colonialism in place were often a type of disinformation that served to justify the subjection of the colonized. So 
Um, and then in the post-colonial era, if we look at, um, you know, my continent, Africa, it's, it's very clear, for instance, and even in the post-colonial era, that states have often limited critical voices by owning and controlling the media, controlling the public sphere, um, engaging in, um, in, in disinformation campaigns. So what we are seeing today, um, when we are again seeing that governments in Africa and elsewhere use the excuse of fake news to enact laws that criminalize dissent, there's a continuity that, that is important to note. Um, I think it's really important that we see this in the global south in the historical uh, in the long historical moment. Um, also, if we look at foreign influence operations today, um, I think it is important to, to recognize that, um, that there have been foreign influence operations um, now often draw on historical loyalties, historical presences in, in Africa, um, and that there's this longer historical view. So that's, I think, the first um, point to make is that um, there's a continuity that we shouldn't see disinformation in the global south, certainly as something that is entirely new. Um, and that there is also the, the, uh, the, the, the we have to understand with within a longer historical perspective. Um, even if these uh, trends and, and forms of disinformation are now facilitated and amplified through new technologies, it is a continuation of an older threat. I think the, the second point maybe to make is that we now see a double threat to the information landscape in the global south, both externally by foreign influence operations and internally by repressive states. And that threat um, is a threat also um, to the is, is a threat to the, the information landscape more broadly, but it is critically also a threat to journalism and to free uh, journalism in the region. Um, and I will get to that when I make a few points about the information environment and the role of advertisement. But I think it is also important to note that um, citizens and audiences in the global south have agency. And it is important when we think about this information um, in these contexts that we also recognize and be very alert to the, the agency that audiences and citizens um, have and the ways that they are practicing that agency, because that can also hold a lesson for the global north. One of the things, one of the points that we've made in our research is that um, we should really um, encourage more attention to the global south and disinformation in the global south, not merely because the global south is important or because, um, you know, more attention should be paid to it, but because there are actually lessons to be learned from the global south experience that can be useful for the global north. And, and one of these is the way that um, citizens and activists and organizations, civil society movements in the global south um, are uh, using that agency to fight this information through various strategies. One of the interesting strategies that we've seen in, in the research that uh, Internet Lab has also been involved with, this project that, um, that I lead, um, is how the fight against this information in the south is linked with other struggles. So the, the fight against this information is not seen in isolation, but it is linked with struggles such as the struggle for access, internet access, internet digital rights, media freedom, uh, education, and so on. And you know, if we have time, I can elaborate on that maybe in question time, but I mean, there are clear examples of how the organizations and activists in the global South see the, the, the countering of disinformation as part of broader struggles. Um, so activists in the global south know that to empower citizens to stamp out this information, these citizens need access to the internet, for instance. They need digital rights. They need freedom of expression. They have to have a good basis of media literacy, etc. So these struggles are often linked. And when we approach disinformation in the global south, it becomes very clear that um, we cannot fight disinformation in isolation. We have to see it as part of this broader ecology, broader array of rights and struggles. So, if if we can, if I can move on then quickly um, to the the questions of the role of advert, uh, advertisement for the information environment and what implications these disparities might have for addressing and mitigating disinformation. Um, I would maybe like to again return to the focus on journalism. Uh, um, if we think that critical independent journalism is one of the most important tools we have to fight against disinformation in the global south, we also have to think about the threat of disinformation as linked to the threats to journalism in the global south. One of the major threats 
um, as I've already alluded to, is ongoing state pressure and repression. Uh, th this is not a new trend. This has been going on for, for many, many years. But what is um, particularly pernicious at the moment is that maybe ironically, states are using the fight against disinformation to enact fake news laws. And that we've seen across the South, but especially also in, in Africa, but I'm more familiar with, um, the, the, the fight against disinformation has become a smokescreen for further repression. And that has become a very pernicious and a very um, important um, thing to focus on. Um, but when we look at advertising and marketing, uh, again, I think there is a double-edged sword or maybe a double two sides of the coin. Um, if we look at the role of advertising in relation to journalism, if we take journalism as a, as a key component, um, uh, as a key guarantee or a key um, uh, weapon again in this, this fight against this information, advertising can be part of the problem. I think that is, we are familiar with those issues, um, misleading advertising, advertising that might look like journalism, but is in fact, um, you know, marketing, the, the very fact that business models can promote a certain type of journalism that is sensationalist, um, that promotes clickbait, that um, focuses maybe only on elite audiences and leaves large parts of highly unequal societies without um, access to media agendas. All of these aspects of advertising and, and marketing in relation to journalism, I think we are familiar with and can, promote, can create problems um, in terms of journalists' ability or journalism's ability to fight disinformation. But I think an aspect that we often lose sight of is that advertising is also important um, for organized news organizations in, in the South, um, especially when it comes to small independent media outlets where the state owns and controls many uh, media outlets. These small independent media outlets are often um, under severe economic threat. We've seen during the COVID pandemic um, how many smaller community organizations, community media, um, uh, independent media in the, on the continent have had to close down or had to severely scale back their operations. And in this regard, advertising and uh, can actually be an, uh, a way for smaller community outlets to sustain themselves. That's obviously not the only model. There are donor-based models and philanthropic models and so on that are really important to um, explore, but advertising is, is one of those avenues. And then I think what we increasingly hear from these news organizations is that the way that advertisements in the online environment are sucked up by big platforms like Google, um, the result is that local news outlets uh, lose an important source of revenue or get a very small part of revenue, and that threatens their sustainability. Um, Another aspect to point to is that the precarious economic environment in large parts of the global south also means that companies often cut back on advertising. So with whenever there's an economic downturn or whenever there's an economic pressure, and, and that is something that the global south um, characterizes the global south almost universally, under such pressure, um, advertising dries up. Um, and, and so that also becomes a, a problem for um, news outlets um, and, and then often opens the, the door for more um, sort of a capture of these uh, news organizations by those people that have money and influence and, and renders them more vulnerable to disinformation. So I think when we look at advertising in the global south, we have to, um, and its relation to disinformation and journalism, we have to understand that it's a, it's a complex issue, um, that there are different aspects to con consider um and and that one has to take uh, context into account i think throughout uh, when we when we study this information in global south um throughout the global south it, it's clear that context is increasingly or it's incredibly important and that we cannot just import models of understanding and analysis from the global north to understand the problem in the global south we have to look at this problem within context and in, within the local specificities so I'll leave that there. Um, those are my sort of initial comments and be happy to hear any questions or feedback. Thank you. Thank you so much, Herman, for the great overview. And I will pass now to Renata Mieli, 
Renata is journalist with a bachelor's degree in social communication from Faculdade Casper Libero. She's currently pursuing her doctorate in communication science program at the School of Communication and Arts at the University of Sao Paulo. And she holds the distinction of being the first female coordinator of the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, the CGI, a multi-stakeholder entity responsible for among other dudes, for establishing strategic guidelines related to the use and development of internet in the country. So, Renata, please, thank you. Thank you, Eloisa. Thank you for the Internet Lab, to the invitation for this section. Uh, I think this uh, dam is very important. Um, in Brazil, we are discussing this a very, very long time. Uh, well, uh, I have some notes here and a uh, few reflections about this problem. Uh, the massive dis dissemination of false and misleading information news has currently drawn attention to the harmful effects it has produced in society. The challenges in developing actions to, on the one hand, protect fundamental rights such as freedom of expression, privacy, and access to information, and on the other hand, preserve the, re the respect for cultural diversity, it's paramount. Disinformation is an, a phenomenon as old as the history of the press. Historically, the content value chain has been dependent to a greater or lesser extent on the sale of advertisements. Advertising has played a role not only in promoting journalism, but also in promoting access to information. Concerns, concerns related to the independence of news production and the use of advertising funds to manipulate public opinion are also not new. The internet, however, has allowed the dissemination of false and misleading news and information to reach unimaginable levels, and its negative effects on society have become even more severe. Understanding this phenomenon necessarily involves understanding the emergency of a network of motiva motivations for the creation, dissemination, and consumption of false and misleading content that amplifies information disorder and is related to the business models of digital platforms. In the sense, the use of the term disinformation industry is appropriate to describe the continuous increase in complexity and size of production chains and networks of actors that emerged is stimulated by high financial investments mostly funded by advertising. Digital platforms have captured an important part of the advertising market, amplifying content through the use of personal and sensitive da data. An important part of this content is misleading, false, harmful, and illegal. Research has suggested that content with demonstrably false information circulated more than verified content feeding digital platforms business models. Content moderation regulation faces issues as the profound lack of transparency on the development of advertisement and the algorithms that showcase them. Beyond that, intermediary liability regimes based on the principle of non-liability of the networks are being questioned, questioned rising issues yet to be settled. As sponsored and boosted content has greater capacity to reach internet users across different platforms, it is fundamental to investigate the damage it causes to the production of information and news and the role advertisement plays in these processes especially in a scenario of massive collecting and use of personal data to profile users and target propaganda. Regulatory initiatives need to take into account both the specific aspects of information flow, the advertising market and its actors, as well as how the business models of large platform favors this information. In order to define strict policies that enable a health informational environment, some directives may be considered. Regulating the role of influencers and programmatic media, this is a very uh, big problem we, we have. Uh, influencers now uh, have more, uh, um, uh, more uh, uh, audience than 
uh, newspapers and uh, journalist content, establish strict measures for transparency and advertisement, also considering sponsored and boosted contents in social media, such as advertising libraries served by digital platforms and disclosure of the rich and profile involved in the ad or boosted content. Rethink corporate responsibility of each intermediaries and links in the advertising chain in relation to the integrity of the public debate, as suggests in the booklet formulated by the Internet Lab ca called Publi or Fake, or Ad or Fake. Other initiatives we hope may be proposed in the discussions carried out in this session. Finally, the Brazil Internet Com Steering Committee carried out a broad consultation process on platform regulations, which among other issues, involved questions about concentrations in the online advertising market and the risks of the platform business model, such as disinfodemic, uh, disinformation or and infodemics. The consultation has more than 20,000 contributions from individuals and organizations of different sectors of society. The analysis of its results is still going on, and we hope that it can be a great value for the formulation of innova innovative and locally designed policy. That's my first uh, reflections. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Renata. Uh, now uh, we are going to open the mic for not only questions, but also considerations and comments and thoughts. So we please those who want to make any interventions and are here, we use that mic over there. And for those who are online, you can either send this via q &A or perhaps uh, raise your hand and we can monitor for allowing you to intervene. So, any? I guess I'll ask a question if people don't want to ask questions. So I'm from the National Democratic Institute, uh, Dan Arnato. Um, I'm curious, um, kind of, you didn't talk too much about political advertising, and that's a lot of what uh, you know we uh, engage uh, in monitoring at, at NDI and, and other election observation groups. So I'm curious, um, you know, the role, particularly of political advertising, and how that could um, you know better be managed using uh, different kinds of um, interventions, whether they're legal, um, you know, mechanisms to to control that, whether they're monitoring systems. I think Cambridge Analytica, as you mentioned, like really demonstrated some of the, the challenges we have in terms of um, data that could be used for targeting and just um, it, it's a problematic component because I think that kind of information is useful for research and for other purposes, but it is uh, unfortunately uh, you know, a, a problematic component of kind of our modern political systems that these, these systems can really become weaponized. So curious about your perspective on that piece. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, we have one more. My name is Giuliano. Uh, there is uh, a difficulty in separating uh, the acting of digital influencers in, in their own work and as a uh, political marketeers and part of uh, advertisement uh, funds uh, is dedicated to uh, political uh, campaigns so I'd like to hear from from uh, the panelists a little bit of how could we uh, develop a, a kind of regulation that could look into uh, how advertising are uh, fomenting disinformation in political campaigns as it's so difficult to separate uh, s uh, political uh, content than uh, other all kinds of content that are circulating in the internet. Thank you. Please. Mm. 
Hi, I, my name is Juliana. I'm a technical advisor from the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee. And in Brazil, we have a self-regulating council for adver advertisement. So I would like to know how uh, the measures uh, to mitigate those risks mentioned can articulate with the self-regulatory frame and with the regulatory from the state. Uh, Maybe, for instance, if we could uh, demand more transparency from these influencers I through the uh, self-regulatory council, or maybe we have too many problems like uh, regulatory capture in these councils and, and a lot of other difficulties. And if we can adapt these spaces and advance, or maybe we should trust in regular regulation and, and and this i think how these things interact thank you thank you juliana anyone else or do we get back to the panel okay so uh we are getting back to the panel and before uh, passing the word to my colleagues i would actually like to to add something to juliana's question which was really great uh, and mentioning that during the project we were developing, we actually mapped some of the, um, the measures, the, this kind of self-regulatory bodies for advertisement and how they interact with these issues. And it's interesting that normally there is a couple of uh, safeguards in place or uh, self-regulatory norms that targets well uh, what would be the information on the narrative at the level of uh, misleading consumers. But when you, you go beyond that, when the narrative, it's the problem with the narrative is less about the project and more about how it can uphold other types of disinformation or even hate speech, depending on how you build the narrative. And when you're speaking about how advertisement may finance um, or be a f source of funding for disinformation outlets, uh, then there is a limit on what we have until today for the self-regulatory bodies. And I think this is one of the challenges. How do we think this way forward? Is this something that should we cover with regulatory uh, approaches, like state regulatory approach? And now in Brazil and Renata, can speak more about that than me. We are discussing this on the fake news bill not with the, um, the platform regulatory bill that has something on advertisement, but there's a lot, there's a long way to go and there is this space that there's not so many uh, parameters and safeguards. And I will stop here to let my colleagues uh, speak and then we'll go actually backwards now so I'll pass first to Renata, and then I will go uh, with Herman and Anna and Eliana. Well, uh, three very good questions. I cannot uh, answer all of them, but um, just a reflection because um, the this this challenge into uh, how we can conceptualize uh, political advertisement is very difficult because uh, it's a very thin line between uh, uh, the freedom of expression, the, the freedom of throw of the ideas, the political ideas. So, uh, conceptualize this is very difficult uh, and is a challenge to address some uh, um, uh, good practice to 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 avoid disinformation in this but um, we are we are dealing we are we are all dealing with that in Brazil we have we passed for through two elections when <laughs> the the flow of uh, disinformation uh, content in political debate was enormous. Uh, 
but um, I think the, it, it's very difficult to categorize, I'm sorry, but categorize uh, political advertisement. Uh, what is this? We are, we are talking about when a political party do some um, content, this is advertisement or not? Just a question for our reflection. How we, uh, how we manage with this? So this is a very big problem and uh, it's not easy to, to face it. Another um, comment uh, is about what Juliana bring to us. And uh, uh, I deal with that before uh, uh, working with uh, internet uh, when, wh when I am from civil society discuss discussing the democratization of communication in Brazil. And our uh, um, private sector on advertising uh, always said that there is a new right that we have to put on human rights. I don't know, that is the advertise. Uh, how can I say that? Uh, advertisement, uh, free. Yes, I don't know, uh, free speech of advertisement as a new hole in the, uh, in the, the human rights. Uh, so they, they use this expression, how, how did you translate? Free, the free speech of our advertisement. They use this to avoid any kind of regulation. Uh, and I, my, myself, I don't um, believe in self-regulation in the sector. I think we need uh, another kind of approach. Of course, uh, there is an importance of uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, structure, but we have to have a um, space, a public space, to discuss uh, advertisement in a more serious way. And we, we didn't talk about this, but uh, political is a problem, but we have problems with health uh, when we have advertisement about uh, uh, me uh, medicamento? medicines, I'm sorry, medicines, and we have problems. Uh, we saw this in the pandemic, and this is a very big problem because this affected uh, people's lives. So uh, that's only a few comments. Thank you so much, Renata. And now back to uh, Herman, who is online. Hi. Um, yeah, I won't say much more than the previous speakers have said, because I think, you know, a lot of that resonates in the South African context. We do have uh, regulations for political advertising, um, but they come from a sort of previous era, pre-social media, really. Um, so the, the advertising of, uh, of political parties prior to elections on, say, broadcast, you know, channels and on um, newspapers, that's fairly well regulated, but um, the, the what happens on social media, I think, is less uh, easily regulated. Um, also, just to confirm with the previous speakers, what do we de define by uh, advertisements? Increasingly, political parties are using all sorts of other ways of guerrilla marketing and things of um, campaigns that, that, you know, is not as easily definable. In this regard, I would say that what is important is regulation, but even maybe more importantly is the um, a sort of coalition of journalists and civil society organizations to also interrogate um, what political parties are saying, to fact check their claims, um, to make audiences aware of the source of claims and campaigns and um, marketing strategies. Uh, so I think regulation in itself, formal regulation um, is, is not enough. It is important that this is um, also forms part of a, a broader, uh, let's say, uh, awareness raising and a, a broader um, systemic 
uh, orientation towards political communication from journalists, source study organizations, etc. Thank you, Herman. And now back to Anna. So um, I won't necessarily comment on political advertising since that's not specifically the issue uh, we're looking at. But uh, I just wanted to re-emphasize the point that um, Herman made in his earlier remarks that independent journalism uh, is the key weapon in uh, combating disinformation and speaking from the perspective of the private sector. As I said, there are many ways that uh, local private sector, local businesses can help invest uh, in uh, healthy info space in independent journalism beyond ethical advertising through um, impact investment or, or blended finance or um, corporate philanthropy or thinking about it as a part of uh, their CSR. And with with that corporate mindset of thinking about uh, their um, sort of impact uh, in the information space, um, you know, we do see local private sector uh, also involved um, uh, in uh, you know just having a voice uh, as policies um, that govern information space may be made. Um, you know, in in um, Armenia, for instance, we uh, work with a local uh, business organization that has um, provided input into national strategy against disinformation. So, kind of just a broader principle that you know whatever laws are being past, the biggest danger is the government just passing the law without any kind of consultation on input from uh, civil society and also from, from the local private sector. Um, and uh, there is also a value um, that we see in um, bringing local business organizations uh, together as part of the, the broader coalitions uh, that were mentioned uh, before uh, to talk about the, the issue of um, securing the information space, uh, mapping it out, thinking about incentives for private sector uh, investment in, in independent media. Uh, and in our work, we see that, for instance, in the Philippines, where we help bring together um, the Philippine Association um, of um, National Advertising uh, and the Makati Business Club, which is one of the major uh, business organizations uh, in the country, to talk about this particular issue, which may not necessarily be kind of a natural uh, topic for, for entities like that. So we're just, you know, let's be creative about uh, which stakeholders are involved and what collaborations are possible. That's really interesting. Thank you, Anna. And now back to Eliana. Thanks. Building on Anna's response also, yes, I guess it's a key to understand which actors are playing. So I would say, uh, taking the question about political advertising, uh, it will be like following the money and also uh, following or understanding uh, which entities are part of the of this ecosystem? Uh, so uh, to bring some transparency on which actors are are participating, and uh, bringing transparency. When I'm, I'm thinking about bringing transparency, for example, is to understand in an, a specific uh, election, for example, uh, we should know which. Uh, uh, marketing companies are taking part, which are contracted by which uh, political party, for example. But not only marketing uh, companies, but also, for example, influencers. Uh, there are many influencers that are contracted by political campaigns. So it's good to know who are um, bringing some information paid and not only like advertising, but advertising like uh, uh, direct in, in the platforms. But also understanding which data providers we have there, which data analyst companies are playing some kind of role, which audiovisual media uh, production companies, communication, digital and public relations companies, and also fact checking um, and public opinion um, uh, companies that are bringing some services during an election. And I'm thinking about during an election because it's very uh, it's delimited. It's kind of a, a, a special moment. It's not like the broader or any time in the in the political life, but it's a very specific and it's possible to bring some uh, regulations by the authority, the electoral authority. And the second idea there could be 
that it's interesting like to understand that uh, some companies are not really aware of some human rights uh, framework like business and human rights uh, framework and it's very good to include them into the conversation and uh, bring some knowledge about these frameworks to let them know that what is allowed and when it's not allowed. And then, of course, I really do think regulation is part of the solution, but it's very, um, we know that it's very uh, complicated because we have also to take care of freedom of expression. But yeah, regulation, not only to the platforms, but also to some actions of other co companies uh, are, are part of the solution. And I will stop there. Thank you, Eliana. And we reached our limit of time. So I would like to thank you, all our panelists today. I think it was a really interesting discussion. And I think there are some uh, takeaways or at least some uh, points we can map from this discussion that actually not only the, the difficult of defining political advertisement, but how when there is a blurred line also between what is commercial advertisement and political advertisement. And we have seen this in Brazil in the last election when you, we do have brands that are engaging politically and where the line of free speech also uh, can be drawn or cannot be drawn. And also the importance <coughs> not only of advancing regulation but also of engaging different actors because despite the fact that we may have uh, actors that have bad intentions within the ecosystem, we may have, we actually have a large amount of actors that are there to be engaged and to be included in the conversation of business and human rights. So I would like to thank you everyone for being here today and thank you for everyone who stayed at almost seven o'clock <laughs> today with us and uh, I hope you have a good rest of IGF and a good rest of Wednesday. <laughs>